Welcome. I'm speaking to you today from Indigenous land within the Treaty 6 territory and Métis Nation of Alberta Region 4. Amiskwachi Weskagan, so-called Edmonton, is a traditional meeting ground, gathering place, and traveling route of the Cree, Salto, Blackfoot, Dene, Nakota Sioux, and Métis peoples. Our Chinese community is committed to honor and uphold the spirit and intent of treaty sex agreements and other treaty agreements between nations. This treaty acknowledgement is to show our gratitude to those whose land we are residing on. Welcome everyone. Wishing you all a happy Mid-Autumn Festival from the Chinese Benevolent Association, Chinese Graduates Association of Alberta, the Chinese Community, and Enoch Cree Nation. The Chinese Community and Enoch Cree Nation have embarked on a relationship building journey to bring the two cultural groups closer together. To celebrate our Mid-Autumn Lantern Festival this year, we are offering two special programs on two special days. One for today on September 19th, and one on the actual Mid-Autumn Day on September 21st. Even though we can't celebrate it in person with you again this year, we can still enjoy it online together, and most importantly, safely. Today's program lineup will begin with Wei Leng Lennon, who will entertain you with a series of stories about Mid-Autumn Festival, starting from personal to historical. Next is the traditional lion dance that brings good luck at happy occasions. Following the Lion Dance show is a special talk by Wei Wong about his personal connection to market gardening and the importance of Chinese market gardening enterprises and their contribution to food security in Edmonton. Additionally, we will show a brief clip from the Edmonton Downtown Farmers Market and Harvest Bounties. The program will end with two cultural performances. Next Tuesday, September 21st, is a re-showing of the 2020 Mid-Autumn Festival concert, which is worth watching again for the multicultural focus. We want to acknowledge the grant from the TD Park People program that is supporting today's activities. As well, we want to thank the many past sponsors, supporters, and volunteers who made the Mid-Autumn Lantern Festival an annual event in Edmonton. It is now time for stories about the Mid-Autumn Festival from Weiling Lennon. Weiling Lennon is a retired elementary school teacher from the Edmonton Chinese Bilingual Program in Edmonton Public Schools. She has a master's degree on its second language acquisition at the University of Alberta. Most of her teaching career was at the Mayanook and Dovercourt Elementary Schools. For six out of those 25 years, she was the Language Resources Manager with Alberta Education. In addition to her regular teaching duties, she was the president of Second Languages and Intercultural Council with the Alberta Teachers Association for four years. She was the exhibits coordinator for Languages Without Borders, the first national second languages conference in 2006. She is a strong advocate for second languages education. Hi, 吃完之後吃到飽飽之後我們還可以拿著個燈籠 也看到很多爸爸媽媽帶著小朋友一起帶著燈籠在街上走媽媽會準備有茶有酒
。咁其實、啊、中秋節咧啊係每一年嘅農曆八月十五日舉行嘅。咁今年咧就係啱啱西曆嘅九月二十一日。啊，點解中國人會慶祝中秋節呢？呢、這個時候就係豐收之後。大家辛苦咗好多日啦，啊咁坐低一齊食一餐飯，啊開開心心，亦都咧係祈福，希望咧誒嚟緊嗰年咧會繼續係有好嘅豐收，同埋咧一屆大小平平安安嘅。咁食完飯之後咧，咁大家會圍住一齊坐，啊有傾下偈啊，有食下水果啊，啊講下故事啊，咁樣樣係非常開心嘅。咁我哋其實都會叫依個係誒團圓飯。啊，同埋咧就中秋夜，誒同誒上月啊上月，咁我哋就會有好多誒食物嘅，咁譬如咧有誒個沙田柚啦，誒有誒水果啦，啊有誒芋頭仔啦，當然唔可以缺少嘅就係月餅啦，啊咁月餅裏邊咧就有好多唔同種類嘅，啊咁而家咧就誒。我覺得過去依十十零廿年咧，就更加多誒唔同款式嘅嘅月餅啊！咁好多時咧，啲人啊，除咗誒誒帶水果誒、呃、一齊慶祝之外咧，咁佢哋都有時因為住嘅地方比較誒細咧，咁就佢哋去公園啊啊去海灘啊，哦咁帶住小朋友佢哋嘅花燈啊同埋食物咧，咁一齊咧高高興興咁誒睇一又圓又大嘅嘅月亮嘅。咁佢哋咧係即係亦都希望咧喺誒嗰個月神啦嚇，即係月光上面有個神仙咁樣樣啦，所謂誒俾佢一啲誒一啲誒保佑咁樣樣嘅。咁其實月球上面係咪真係有月神咧？啊，聽講啊，傳說五五千多年前咧，天空上面係掛住十個太陽，因為嗰啲太陽光猛烈，地上嘅植物係生長唔唔成。所以咧，好多人咧就冇嘢食，餓死或者渴死嘅。咁好彩咧，有一個神射神箭手啊，咁佢叫做後羿，啊佢咧射箭係好叻嘅，啊八發八中咁樣樣。咁佢好勇敢咧，就啊將九個太陽咧用箭啊射落咗嚟。咁之後咧，大家都有安樂嘅生活啊過啦。咁大家為咗係誒表示感謝後羿咧。咁佢哋好敬佩佢，就推舉佢做領袖。咁好為咗領袖之後咧，係即係好開心啦，又好威風啦。咁之後咧，嗰、那個性格咧就變得好殘暴。咁佢殘暴之後咧，咁佢不得誒更更加咧就係想啊長生不老啊，永遠都唔會死嘅。咁佢就去揾啊西王母啊，向西王母要求俾佢長生不老藥。咁所以王母咧，亦都即係誒見到佢係就為大家做咗啲事，咁就俾咗佢啦。咁誒、嗯、後羿咧有一個又善良又美麗嘅妻子啊，叫做嫦娥。嫦娥咧就好擔心啦，佢覺得如果後羿嘅性情變得咁殘暴，如果佢可以永遠都活著嘅話，咁好多人民都唔會有好日子過嘅喎。咁點樣好咧？咁佢有一晚，啊趁住咧後羿咧誒出咗街，靜靜地咧入佢間房偷咗佢個瓶長生不老藥。咁但係唔好彩咧，就係佢離開嘅時候，啱啱咧就係後羿翻嚟啦。咁後羿咧就睇到，喂，你做乜偷咗我嘅長生不老不老藥？咁啊追住上我咯喎。咁上我好驚咧，咁啪啪啪啪啪啪。咁佢拎住嗰個啲誒長生不老藥，佢都唔知點算。啊！見到咧，啊後羿咧跟得好貼啊，差唔多追到啦。咁就佢咧就一時就將個長生不老藥咧放咗喺嘴裏邊，咁啊繼續跑，跑跑跑，突然間唔小心，咁、嗯、吞吞咗嗰啲長生不老藥喎。咁佢都唔知點樣做好啦。哎呀，唔好啦，繼續都係繼續走啦。咁走一下走一下，覺得點解好似飄飄然咁咧？咁望下佢下邊，咦？點解點解個宮殿喺我腳下邊嘅？咁繼續咁感覺到飄啊飄啊飄啊飄啊，飄到越高越遠喎、啊，終於咧就飄到去月亮上邊。所以咧，好多人就就話啦：，哦，月女嫦娥啊，喺月亮上邊住咗一一位漂亮嘅嫦娥。
咁好多人咧都相信，咁亦都好多人咧係誒信奉誒與神嘅，希望咧佢可以俾我哋誒平安嘅生活咧。但係喺一九六八年嘅時候，美國太空人唐斯朗佢搭地啊搭登陸到誒月亮上邊，登陸喺月球上邊，仲插咗支美國旗添，證實咗月亮上根本係冇上岸，根本係冇月神嘅。但係，我覺得呢個故事係好漂亮，係好美麗一個傳話啊傳說。咁我希望咧，大家都誒有興趣聽啦。嚇，我自己就覺得好有趣啦。嚇，希望你都覺得係咧。另外，我想同你分享一個故事咧，就係、是、關於月餅。月餅點樣被用嚟推翻一個王朝咧？喺中國歷史裏邊，大約十四世紀，當時係元朝。元朝系外族嘅人，佢对汉人系非常残酷嘅，吓佢哋咧系监视得汉人非常紧要，同埋咧每一年啊收获嘅时候咧都要交好重好重嘅税收嘅。汉人受苦咁多年，终于有人就提议啦：，我哋一定要起义，我哋唔可以继续俾佢哋咁样残残害我哋。咁佢點點樣將個信息係傳到全國嘅人民都知道咧？就係、是、月餅啦！佢哋將日子、時間寫咗喺紙條上邊，放咗喺月餅個餡裏邊。咁當啊人民咧啊切開個月餅嘅時候，哇！睇到哦，知道幾時啦？啊，要準備乜嘢啦？咁大家咧就同時喺嗰個時間，同時喺嗰日就係、是、中秋節，嗰一年嘅中秋節。大家帶住鋤頭啦、褲頭啦、棍啦、誒泥鏟啦，佢哋有乜就帶乜，非常非常英勇。咁佢同援兵咧，啊援朝嘅不誒兵士咧，啊搏鬥得好好激烈。但係因為佢大家都好好熱情，啊一定要咧推翻呢個援朝嘅嘅皇帝，終於佢哋都戰勝咗啦，佢哋贏咗啦。咁就係一三六八年嘅時候咧。就係、是、呢個元誒新嘅誒呢個朝代咧，明朝咧啊就誒出現啦啊！咁下一次啊，如果你食月月餅嘅時候咧，或者你都可以諗一諗，哦，原來月餅唔係單唔單單係好食喎，唔單單係一年一次中秋節，我哋同屋企人一齊團聚，係一個美味嘅食品。原來仲有一段咁特別嘅故事啊！喺中國。啊！歷咁長五千多年嘅歷史裏邊，亦都有一個啊角色嘅。咁我希望咧，誒、啊、你哋係今年嘅啊八月十五啦，就係、是、九月二十一日嗰晚咧，記得同埋啊屋企人啦，誒、啊、去公園啊，啊或者係你屋後邊嘅誒後院啊，咁咧一齊咧賞月，咁記得帶好好食嘅食物。啊，當然月餅係唔少得啦，咁仲有誒、呃，我都仲有，仲有可以帶花生喎，咁啊誒，可以開帶葡萄籽啦，啊，好多唔同嘅水果，因為咧秋天咧好多水果係收成嘅，咁我希望你哋大家咧可以誒同屋企人誒歡度一個好開心嘅中秋夜啦，咁我亦都希望咧將來有機會啊，就為大家講故事，啊，咁我就喺呢度咧就祝大家身體健康。出入平安，多謝，再見。Okay. Good afternoon, grandparents, parents, and children. My name is Mrs. Lennon. Today, I will share some of the stories that I have learned about Big Autumn Festival. First, let me tell you my childhood memories of this special day of the year. And then I will share two short stories with you. I remember when I was little, I always looked forward to this time of the year. I still do. For most little children, where there is food and where there are toys, there will be fun. I remember we had lanterns made of thin bamboo strips and thin colored paper. The paper has to be thin enough for the candlelight to shine through. Some children. Made lanterns themselves, or maybe with their parents. On the night of Mid Autumn Festival, after a feast, children would carry the lanterns with a stick about two feet long, 
and they parade through the neighborhood. Lanterns were in the shape of star fruits, fish, airplane, butterflies, and even bunnies. And bunnies are different. They have four little wooden wheels. And the owner will pull a string connected to the body of the paper bunny. And they were so adorable. So how do Chinese people around the world celebrate Mid-Autumn Festival? Mid-Autumn Festival is always celebrated on the 15th day of the eighth month in the lunar calendar. But in 2021, the festival falls on Tuesday, September 21st. In China, the 15th day of the eighth month is in fall. Farmers work really hard in harvesting their crops. They celebrated the harvest with a feast of delicious food with their families. And after the dinner, they prepared a table full of fruits, pomelo, bananas, persimmons, apples, peanuts, taro roots, lingjiao, and mooncakes. They will position the table outdoors facing the beautiful harvest moon. They would light incense sticks and candles. And they burn some special paper, some are pasted with some gold paper, some with silver paper. And they are burned, and the incense sticks, they are offerings to the goddess who is believed to be living on the moon. And this is how the custom of praying to the moon and goddess, thanking her for the harvest and asking her for blessings to have a good harvest the following year. Most commonly, the custom is to ask for good health and a stable life for the family. Many Chinese families around the world still practice this tradition by having a very delicious dinner together. Afterwards, they may bring some seasonal fruits to the parks or to beaches to enjoy the beautiful harvest moon. Is that really a moon goddess on the moon, really? <laughs> the legend says that many, many years ago, there were 10 suns in the sky. The earth was extremely hot. People were dying of thirst and hunger because foods could not be grown due to the extreme hot weather. There was a very good archer named Hao Yi. He used his bow and arrows to shoot down nine sons, nine out of ten. The citizens were so grateful that they nominated him to be their leader. He enjoyed the power as a leader, and gradually he became cruel to his people. He even wished to live forever. So he visited the Queen Mother of the West and obtained a bottle of elixir potion. His beautiful wife, Chang'e, thought that if he could live forever, then the kingdom would become a bad place for everyone. So one night, she stole the bottle of elixir. Unfortunately, Hao Yi realized that the bottle was missing and ran after Chang'e. She rang and rang and rang. As Hao Yi got closer to her, she did not know what to do. She put the elixir in her mouth and then continued running. And suddenly, she felt really light and she realized that the palace was below her feet and she was rising higher and higher into the sky until she landed on the moon. This courageous legend was passed from generations to generations in China for more than 5,000 years. In 1968, American astronaut Neil Armstrong walked on the moon and proved that there was no goddess on the moon. I think many people were really sad to find out that. But it is a beautiful story, don't you think? Now, I'm going to tell you another story about mooncakes. Mooncakes were used to overthrow a dynasty. In Chinese history, towards the end of the Yun Dynasty, about 14th century, the Han people in China, they were extremely oppressed by the soldiers of Yin Emperor. 
Yun people were barbaric, and they used to live outside the Great Wall that protected China. Once they were in power, they treated the Han people very, very poorly and cruelly. The Hans had to pay heavy taxes and were guarded and beaten by soldiers all the time. So one day, someone had an idea of uprising. The Han people secretly placed messages in the mooncakes that people give to each other in the celebration of the Autumn Festival. They agreed to use whatever weapons they could use, such as like wooden staff, asses, bamboo poles, having holes, etc. They used whatever weapons they had and attacked the Union soldiers on the 15th day of the eighth month of that year. That was Beat Autumn Festival of that year. They fought very really hard and they were very brave and the uprising was successful and they ended the Yun Dynasty and a new Ming Dynasty was born in 1368. The Han people returned to safe and peaceful lives again. So next time, when you taste a piece of mooncake, think of what an amazing tool of communication it was. I wish that on the day of Mid Autumn Festival this year, you can go to a park with your family, with lanterns in your hand, and have a good visit with your family, tell stories, enjoy the fresh air and the nice sky, and of course, the beautiful full moon while having all the delicious food that you brought along. Maybe you can even see the outline of the lady and her jay rabbit on the moon. Thank you very much for listening to my storytelling about the Autumn Festival. I hope that we could meet again, maybe in person next time. I wish you all a happy Me Autumn Festival and good health. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you, Weiling. I now know what to do to express my gratitude. I will slip a note of thanks for your presentation into a mooncake and present it to you. Next is the Lion Dance performed by Sheng De Tai Chi Praying Mantis Martial Arts Association. Wow, so energetic. I wish I could have one of those mooncakes. Our next program is a TD Park People presentation by Wei Wong. I will stop here and let Lan Chan Marples host the talk. Hello, everyone. I'm speaking to you on Indigenous land within Treaty 6 territory, a Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 4. Welcome to our fifth and final Parks and Green Spaces Chinatown South Talk series funded by TD Park People Grant. I have with me Wei Wong. His topic on Chinese market gardening is a good fit with the Mid-Autumn Festival theme. This Chinese festival is traditionally celebrated during harvest time in autumn, so right now. And in fact, on September 21st is the actual Mid-Autumn Festival day. It is now my pleasure to introduce Wei. Wei Wang was born into a market gardening family in Edmonton and has experienced firsthand challenges and hardships of this occupation. He maintains a backyard garden where he grows vegetables and collects seeds to share. Uh, Wei has spoken about the forgotten history of Chinese immigration to Canada at schools and universities, 
public events and work webinars. He has been a presenter for the Edmonton and District Historical Society, Alberta Genealogical Society, and most recently, University of Alberta International. He continues to share his knowledge about Chinese Canadian history and his family's 100 year milestone in Canada. So it's wonderful to have you here with us today. Wei, I'm so looking forward to your presentation. Thank you for joining us, all of you. And uh, I'd like to um, especially thank uh, Lan Chan uh, for inviting me uh, to make this talk. Also, thanks to um, TD Park People Grants, the Chinese Benevolent Association of Edmonton, and the Chinese Graduates Association of Edmonton. My father was the first person in my family uh, to come to Canada, and I am the first generation of our family who was born here in Canada. Now, born into a market gardening family, as Lan mentioned, I now research and write about the history of Chinese immigration to Canada and share my own family's history to audiences uh, like this. And I also wish you all a happy Mid Autumn Festival. As Lan mentioned, it's officially on September 21. And this is a time to celebrate the harvest, to gaze at the harvest moon if you have time, and indulge in eating traditional mooncakes. Now, growing up, it was the busiest time on a market gardener as we started to bring in the harvest uh, before the first frost. Now, this presentation is uh, close to my heart. As 100 years ago, my father stepped onto Canadian soil for the first time. He was only 13 years old. Now, my father, Wang Bakjing, has his origins in China. His ancestral village is uh, Chiuging in uh, Toisan County in Guangdong province, which is located about 200 kilometers west of Hong Kong. Now, most of the early Chinese immigrants who came to Canada from the Guangdong region, and Taishan is known as the first home of the overseas Chinese. The Canadian Pacific steamships, Empress Line of ships brought many Chinese from Southern China to their destination across the Pacific. The picture here is the Empress of Asia. And this is the same ship that my father sailed on from Hong Kong to Vancouver. The 1921 immigration certificate of my father uh, indicates um, that he was exempt from paying the head tax, which was first enacted in 1885 after the uh, Canadian Pacific Railway was completed. Now, exemptions were granted to diplomats, government representatives, merchants, clergy, tourists, scientists, and students. My father came as a merchant's son, so he did not have to pay the head tax of $500. The merchant was a neighbor who was successful with the business in Canada and was willing to help a desperate family. My father arrived on or arrived in Vancouver on the Empress of China, or the, sorry, Empress of Asia on August 8, 1921, when he was 13. Regardless, he was expected to find employment to start paying off his passage debts and send remittances home to help his poor family while earning his keep here. Two years later, after his arrival in 1923, Canada passed the Chinese Exclusion Act that barred all Chinese from coming to Canada, except for a few exemptions. Now on this map, uh, he likely started as unskilled labor in Vancouver, and then making his way eastward as a cook, arriving in Alberta in 1924. He most likely acquired his cooking skills in one or more of the prairie restaurants, cafes, or coal mining camps. The map shows places 
that were found in one of his notebooks. Having been born into China's agrarian society, he certainly would have gained some experience in growing vegetables before he sailed for North America. Making a circuitous route to Alberta as a cook, he may have been hired by a man named Gumlan, who was engaged in farming, restaurant work, and general merchandise in Southern Alberta at a place called Retlaw, which was located near the Canadian Pacific Railway tracks. Here, my father's affinity for market gardening may have been rekindled and he would have learned valuable skills for the Canadian climate. In this notebook, there was a date entry of October 29, 1930. And this notebook recorded vegetable seed varieties. You can see that uh, at the top, there's uh, onions with the name of the onion, carrots, beets, um, and so on. Onions, and uh, the last one being cauliflower. His earliest market garden in Edmonton was located near the high level bridge. Uh, Dr. Max Dolgoy, our family physician recalled receiving my father as one of his earliest patients and said that he worked on a market garden south of the general hospital and near the high level bridge. From an article by renowned Edmonton historian, Tony Cashman uh, called the bridge that refused to fall. And I quote, the Royal Ganora Club sits on the site of the former Chinese market garden. After the harvest in 1930, my father made a trip back to China to his ancestral village for an arranged marriage to Yang Si, my mother. And because of the Canada's Discriminatory Chinese Exclusion Act, he returned alone in the spring of 1931. This sketch made in 1934 shows similar implements that we used right up until 1975. We had repurposed tobacco containers punched with holes on a long stick, which was used for watering crops. We had five gallon containers with wire handles being carried with the wooden pole over our shoulders. And the wide bamboo hats were favored to provide protection from the sun. The photograph shows the manual labor involved using garden hose for planting or weeding. And my father knew other market gardeners like uh, G. Gutt, who farmed on the John Walter site near the 105th Street Bridge from 1936 to about 1950. And our family also knew his son, G. Cheng, as well as he had market gardens in close vicinity uh, to ours. The address of Hot Wu, which was found in Henderson's directories from 1935 to 1940, the market gardening partnership my father had with uh, uh, Lang Kai Chu was at 9013-101 Avenue in Riverdale. This was locally referred to as the Chinaman's Garden. Now from a uh, membership, uh, with a um, Facebook page, I found from a person, Greg Novak, a resident who grew up in Riverdale. And he, and he said, at recess, I often marveled at the people tending the garden, carefully watering. The very large cultivated plot of beautiful black Riverdale soil supported multiple rows of a variety of vegetables. I would frequently see people weeding with hoes, setting what looked like cedar shingle pieces to protect young plants from the harsh sun. Along the perimeter of the plot, there were stacks of wooden crates and boxes, which were used to ship the fresh vegetables to either the city market or perhaps restaurants in the downtown area of Edmonton. The gardeners were extremely hard workers and could be seen hunched over the cabbages and onions all day long, giving the plants water, killing the potatoes, staking the tomatoes, or picking peas and beans. 
that sort of intense attention fascinated me because though we all had gardens in those days, the market garden got tremendous results. In the fall, there were huge piles of potatoes, cabbages, and carrots harvested. It was a business and did very well, I imagine, thanks primarily to their incredible hard work. So that was from a resident that uh, basically grew up in the Riverdale area. Now, this horse in the picture is one of two horses that the partnership owned. The uh, gray dapple color of the horse suggested that it is a Percheron or a cross of sorts. The harness bridle with the blinder suggests that the horse was multifunctional and likely pulling plows or wagons while also packing riders around. And this was really typical of Alberta draft horses uh, bred on family farms. The envelope is uh, of the uh, address with Hop Wu um, at 9013101 Avenue. And that was the address of the partnership. 1943, still sharing the address of Hop Wu in, in, uh, in the garden, uh, my father's unemployment insurance ID card stated his occupations as gardener and cook. In 1944, on this certificate of registration, which was issued by the Consulate of the People's Republic of China in Vancouver, my father is wearing typical overalls for working on the market garden. On August 18, 1947, uh, my father's occupation was recorded as self-employed gardener on his Canadian citizenship application and the house he lived in was at the rear of old government house grounds. He had befriended Ernest Stowe, who was the high ranking chief provincial gardener of Alberta. And this friendship endured until Stowe retired and moved to the West Coast in 1952. This 1948 aerial photograph is of the government house area and outlined is probably where my father uh, market garden. The market now is part of what is known as Government House Park. My father also must have known Hong Li, who gardened near the Victoria Golf Course, as my father traveled between the Riverdale and the Government House Market Gardens. This certificate of Canadian citizenship granted to my father was dated 1949, January 17. His occupation was stated as a gardener. And in 1949, my father's house at the rear of government house was moved onto a new foundation in Calder and renovated to become their new home at 12782 113th Street. I was told by my brother that that house was moved along Grote Road and up into the Calder area, but I'm not entirely sure that Grote Road was even finished by that time. Anyway, reunited after 18 and a half years after being married in China, this is where my father and mother finally started their family together in Edmonton. He was 41. She was 37, and they hadn't seen each other for 18 and a half years. Now, Young Si, my mother, is seen here in 1949 with a 1937 Dodge pickup farm truck at Calder, and also standing in the fields of Riverdale. My first home was at that address, 12782 113th Street, in the northwest corner of the highlighted property. Uh, this aerial view was taken in 1957. And my brother remembers that dad used to grow onions that could overwinter, uh, seeded, and then died. And so these onions survived year after year, even after we were gone from this property. And when people started to use the park, 
they saw lots of wild onions, hence they named it uh, locally as Onion Park. And it is now part of the Lauderdale Off-Leash Dog Park. Between 1956 and 1959, we rented an additional 20 acre market garden east of the Cloverdale Bridge, I'm sorry, the Clover Bar Bridge from a group of Chinese landowners who were unsuccessful as market gardeners. They left a water pump, irrigation pipes, and sprinklers, which my father used to his advantage. And this area is now a part of the recreational Sunridge ski area. Uh, between 1960 and 1975, we had a 10 acre parcel of land, which was purchased in what was then the Waldemere uh, area, located north on Highway 28, which is now 97th Street. And this last market gardener, this market garden was referred to as our Nemeo farm. The Nemeo farm was prepared by burning off the brush and weeds before it was cultivated for crops for the first time. You can see in this picture in 1961, uh, the rectangular hotbeds uh, were used to germinate and start cabbage and cauliflower seedlings before they were transplanted by hand into the fields. Cabbages were our main crop, green cabbage. And that's me and my brother leaning on our Plymouth station wagon. The Nemeo Market Garden area has now been developed into residences, highlighted in yellow. And outlined in red is today's developing Griesba uh, neighborhood. This is a Ford 9N tractor that is similar to the one that we used to cultivate the fields at our Nemeo farm uh, between 1959 and 1975. Our crops of Western vegetables were beets and broccoli, bunching onion, cabbage, which are, was our main crop, our carrots, cauliflower, cucumbers, dill, kohlrabi, lettuce, onions, parsley, peas and radishes, rhubarb, spinach, turnips, and squash. The Chinese vegetables that we grew were bok choy, uh, coriander or cilantro, gai choy, which is Chinese mustard, gai lan, Chinese broccoli, uh, snow peas, and siu choy is Chinese cabbage. And from year to year, we saved and dried seeds from our mature Chinese vegetables to plant in following years. This uh, machine, Planet Junior Hand Push Seeder, was used for crops that needed to be planted in rows those being carrots and beets, dill, onions and lettuce, spinach, bok choy, gai choy, gai lan, and uh, siu choy. And uh, we uh, kids were prohibited from using this implement. It was my father who uh, was the only one that, uh, that he allowed to use, or he used it uh, solely on his own. And uh, it could be modified to have blades attached to be used as a wheel hole. Now our crops are sold to places like McDonald's Consolidated, uh, Scott National, Brown Fruit Company, Western Grocers, and Woodward's at uh, Westmount. The McDonald's Consolidated Wholesale was located at uh, 10128 105th Avenue from 1914 right up to 1965. And then it was replaced by a new warehouse at 139 uh, Street and Yellowhead Trail, which is close to Dover Court, uh, where we lived in uh, about 1959 all the way to 1975. And direct sales of Chinese produce were delivered to the Kuang Hing Company, uh, located at 10126 97th Street. That uh, merchant was established in 1940. And we also delivered to the popular New World restaurant in Chinatown. 
Here is the last sales order dated October 21, 1975 for Chinese vegetables uh, for the Kuang Hing Company. Uh, it was for 65 pounds of bok choy at uh, 35 cents per pound and 25 pounds of gai choy at 30 cents per pound. Sounds like a real bargain. And you can see my father, um, when he uh, wrote these invoices or sales orders for uh, Chinese merchants, he wrote in Chinese. And for those like uh, orders from McDonald's Consolidated or Brown Fruit Company, he had written them in English. Our Namil farm was sold on November 1st, 1975, when my parents retired. That was our last farm. And I have a map of the market gardens that uh, my father and family operated. Four of the areas are now associated with recreation. That's the Government House Park, uh, the Royal Glenora Club, in Beverly, the Sunridge Ski Area, and in Calder Onion Park, which is uh, now the Lauderdale Off-Leash uh, Dog Park. And two have become residential areas, uh, Riverdale and Nemeo, which is now basically built up as the Eau Claire neighborhood. <clears throat> These are my uh, father's income tax records that I have from uh, 1956 to 1975. Uh, if you look closely, um, the highest net income we had was $6,056 in 1958. And that was the income from two market gardens, uh, Calder and that 20 acre uh, rented market garden in Beverly. Our bleakest year was 1965 with a net income of only $587. But regardless, my father did not look for alternate employment in the winter, but instead took the time off to rest and socialize in Chinatown. An article in 2009 uh, in the Edmonton Horticultural Society Centennial publication called The Century of Gardening in Edmonton features a story of our town market garden. If you're interested, you can look that up. And in 2015, uh, publication, a book, Why Grow Here, Essays on Edmonton's Gardening History, a book by Catherine Chase Merritt, uh, covers our family's market garden history in chapter eight. And that cover feature is a photo of my mother at the Hop Woo Market Garden in Riverdale. Uh, it was colorized from the black and white photo that we saw earlier. And for more details about our family's history, I've written some articles that have been published in uh, Relatively Speaking, which is the quarterly journal of the Alberta Genealogical Society. So every couple of years, uh, I've written something and uh, the uh, Alberta Genealogical Society uh, deemed it uh, good enough to be published. And upcoming in uh, 2022, that's provided the pandemic uh, disappears. Um, this exhibition called uh, Chinese Merchants in Western Canada, the movement of people, products and money has, uh, you know, uh, has been postponed, but hopefully it will go forward in 2022. It was produced by the University of Alberta, Bruce Peel Special Collections, and a part of it will feature our market gardening family's history. So thank you for inviting me and listening uh, to my story. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. So thank you, Wei, for such an inter interesting family story. Wow, that is incredible. <laughs> um, I'm always reminded when I hear you speak and others how rich our Chinese history is in Edmonton. It's like weaving a tapestry of memories about Edmonton's Chinese community and the families who uh, came here, you know, for many, many years uh, mm -hmm. and what, you know, and their occupation is in particular and what they've did. Um, it's always worthwhile to remember that and to document that. I'm so glad that you're doing, um, you know, 
piecing that together and uh, writing about it. I think that many of us who try to look for Chinese uh, history uh, in Edmonton find that there's a, a big gap, uh, a void, and it's and it's almost like a, a vessel that we need to keep filling in order to get uh, to be able to um, have some the stories for future generations to read about. Thank you, Wei. This is very, this is great. Um, I am sure, Hans. Uh, thank you for uh, for the presentation. It's really, really. I enjoyed it a lot, and I'm sure the uh, others have also. And so, kudos to you. And um, everybody, thank you for participating. Yeah, thank you very much. Happy uh, Mid Autumn Festival. E yes, don't tell Phi Law. And now a short clip on the Edmonton Downtown Farmers Market. What does the harvest season mean to you? Harvest season means uh, First of all, a lot of work, uh, but it's very rewarding at the end. It's nice to see our all our crop in the building, ready for winter. It takes a lot of hand work, but uh, we have a very good crew. So it's just nice to see that everything in the building, and we're ready for winter. We'll have a nice supply of, uh, of a lot of these vegetables right up until Christmas. Most of the uh, root crops we'll have all winter long. So carrots and potatoes will go right through till the new crop next year. It's, uh, it's just very rewarding. It's a lot of work. It's, it's good to see a lot of happy customers because of it. And uh, yeah, I wouldn't want to do anything else. <laughs> I'm Melissa Peter, and I'm working here with Reclaim Organics. Um, the main thing for harvest season is the bounty of everything. We have a full table of everything we've ever had for the whole season, including our fresh winter squash that we just harvested. Um, we love having the variety because whenever you can get as much as you can at the peak of the season, I guess, you can make entire meals for the entire week with everything that we have here. It's a very busy time of the year, but it's very rewarding because it all works out in the end. There's always stuff that you can have and harvest and share with everybody. Another great thing about the harvest in the fall is that a lot of it can be preserved. So even though the fall season has its limits, when the frost comes and snow covers everything in the field, you can still preserve everything and then have an amount for the stuff for the rest of the winter. So relishes and pickles, as well as all of our tomatoes, potatoes, the winter squash, those all have a really long shelf life. So it's great that we can take the bounty of the fall and extend it for the rest of the season. My name is Rowan, uh, owner of the Shanghai Green Onion Cake. Uh, what I like to do for Mid-Autumn Festival in my family is to eat uh, the moon cakes and green onion cakes. I think it makes a great combo. Uh, we, we typically like to at least have a family dinner together. Uh, and of course moon cakes and a few other desserts too. Uh, these are actually made in our kitchen here. Uh, flour, dough, uh, green onions, and me and uh, my dad actually make these. And to be on our left here we have our pre-cooked ones. Super easy, just pop them into the toaster. But if you do have more time, on our right there we do have our uncooked ones. Where you can pan fry it up and you can add all types of other sauces and oils in there as well. Malaysian cuisine. Yeah. But how we do? Yeah. We do. We have mooncake, then we have kind of like get together, and also we have that kind of like we call hot pot. So all family sit in round table. So yeah. Yeah. Do you guys go out? No. 
pretty much because it's those are most like event for family. So we pretty much like stay home and then we with family together. My name is uh, Brad Smoliak from Kitchen by Brad. Just doing uh, some shopping today, and uh, you know the reason that I really come down here is I love the people, and the food's just better. I mean, uh, half this stuff or most of the stuff has just come out of the ground, you know, within the last 24, 48 hours, or brought down from Red Deer or Lacombe, and it's it's just so much better than uh, going to a uh, grocery store. Brought up so, 
then of course we're open year round uh, on the weekends, Saturday and Sunday. And uh, my son, he's been in the business since he was eight years old, so he's been been busy with that. I uh, made the quilt. My son inspired me to uh, make a sign for his business. So fresh BC fruit under the tree. So uh, the quilt is quite uh, involved because there's different uh, piecing involved with it. A log cabin that uh, this is a log cabin design, and uh, and then of course there was applique on top. So all the little pieces are cut out individually and uh, sewn on. And then of course the fresh BC fruit was also appliqued on so it took uh, oh it took a good three weeks or more of constant work and it's sort of a passion it's one of my first quilts that i've made that's great thank you thank you <laughs> the two cultural performances will end our program for today be sure to tune in on tuesday september 21st to catch the mid-autumn concert showing at 5 p.m to 8 30 p.m on youtube the first performance is called Rapture Dance by the Alberta Chinese Dance Company, and the second is Water Lily, performed by Nanyan Lao and Gigi Young. Please enjoy. <laughs> 